Hey everyone, a big welcome back to the Nick Elson Show, season seven, co-figure, episode four, and another amazing guest to bring you in the shape of Danielle Webb. Hi. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm good, yourself? Good stuff, yes. Although I'm trying to work out actually how you get a chance to relax, because looking at the kind of your list of things that you do, not inclu- not exclusive, but I'm sure you'll tell us more, but children's author, founder and creator of Life Being This All in Short Perspective, senior qualified youth worker, and you, you're you just into so much, vice chair for Little People UK. First question, do you have a TV? <laughs> yes, <laughs> although it's not used very often. <laughs> exactly. um, my laptop is definitely used 90% more than my TV is. Okay. Um, but do you know what? I love what I do. So yeah. it's very, I can't say that burnout isn't real. It is. And I do have to catch myself. Yeah. Um, Especially being young. I think a lot of the work I'm in isn't the typical work for yeah. someone who's 24. Yeah. Um, so I, I have to keep telling myself to walk before I can run. Um, <laughs> But yeah, overall, I, I love what I do. So it doesn't, it doesn't always feel like work. That's not a bad place to be in. But like you said, there are pitfalls to that as well, isn't there? They're kind of, I very much get that. Actually, it's not about kind of how hard you work. It's the emotional energy behind it as well. And I think everybody that I've spoken to over the seven seasons that are doing this, that, that actually do something with a purpose and a passion, they always tread that very fine line between overwhelm and burnout and oh, doing uh-huh. something for a cause. A hundred percent. And your work, especially in youth work, which is what I'm trained in, that's what my degree's in. Mm. You know, you're working with real people, yeah. real yeah. lives, real challenges, whilst potentially facing some of those challenges yourself. And with the other line of work I do, which is my advocacy, which is obviously my books and life being little, mm. that's a lot of my own personal story. Yeah. So I have to safeguard myself in the sense of making sure that when I share or when I do that element of work I have that time to go okay I need to recharge because you can't pour from something that's empty which is something I've definitely learned in the last year or so yeah. is that in order to do this work right we have to we also have to be right and my manager tells me that a lot and <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm working on it <laughs> um in the spirit of honesty and transparency uh danielle just informed me that it was dwarfism awareness month as if this was happening by design i promise you it's not i'm not that clever um but actually there's an amazing kind of uh coincidence that's happened there um so we're going to come to all of this and the reason why you do what you do and what you do mm-hmm. but i want to take you right back uh, <laughs> tell us about baby danielle tell us about growing up and where you where you're from education family that kind of stuff okay so i was born in a small town called portishead which is on the outskirts of bristol okay um, i lived there until actually moving to university So I was very much born and raised. I was a home small town girl, which you wouldn't think in the work I do now. But I was very much a small town, small town girl. Um, And having dwarfism, which is the condition I have, I have achondroplasia. I was actually born into an average height family. So I'm the only person in my family who has my condition. Um, This is actually common amongst people with dwarfism. 80% 80 of people with dwarfism are born to average height families. Um, and I was one of those 80 percent so growing if we're going way way back when I was probably your typical outgoing you know little girl um, have always loved the creative arts have always loved writing and telling stories which I think is apt now that I'm an author (laughs) Um, but you know I was always very inquisitive I always my mum always used to say I asked questions if there was something I could ask a question about I would ask a question. And if you couldn't ask a question, I would still find a question to ask about it. I always wanted to learn, always wanted to find out more, which I think is still very apt in the person I am today. Um, and yeah, I, I went to I went to a lovely primary school. I had a lovely upbringing, lived with my mum, Nan and my auntie. So it was an all girls household, um, a little bit chaotic, as you can imagine. But we I had a, you know, I had a great I had a great upbringing, even being the only one with dwarfism that never really affected me as a at a young age it wasn't until I got to secondary school that I think I really realized the difference because I typically now am the average size of a seven-year-old 
So if you imagine throwing a seven-year-old in a high school of 2,000 pupils, I was the definition of a small fish in a big pond. <laughs> um, I like what I, you did there. <laughs> I think, you know, that that did, that's probably where my confidence probably got knocked a little bit. But in that, ultimately, it led me to the work that I do now mm. in the learning that I had in that experience in knowing what awareness I needed. The work I do now, is, I always say, is what 14-year-old me needed. Yeah. So that's the ba- that's the baseline of the work that I do. Um, so I yeah, went to went on to secondary school, went on to college. I always knew that I wanted to work with people and I had some very influential adults in my life that I kind of wanted to become. I knew what they had done to for me. So yeah. I was like, yeah, I w- I want to get into youth work. I w- I want to give back. So went to college to do my children's play learning and development diploma at Western College. And then in 2017, went to the University of South Wales, which is where we came together. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, yeah, started in 2017, uh, doing my Bachelor of Arts degree. I was a lockdown graduate, so you can imagine that that came with wow. all the different dimensions that our, um, our climate threw at us at that point. Yeah. Um, and stayed, to do, stayed on to do my Master's, and it was actually get involved with the organisation I work with, which is Urban Circle, mm. that made me stay in Newport. I had no intention. I always thought I was going to be a home girl. If, you know, anyone who knew me before 2017, yes, I had confidence, but I was, I was a home girl. I liked my surroundings. And I think that was a level of safety. Yeah. You know, I think when you have a disability, you get to know, you get, you get to know your comforts. You mm. get to know what you don't have to think about the environments that you know were safe and protective of you so I had absolutely no intention moving to a big city where that was all going to change um but you know like I said I I enjoy what I do and the opportunities that Urban Circle gave me and the work that I went on to do which is the work I do now yeah um yeah I mean we spoke earlier about things just falling into place and that was something that just fell into place and here we Uh are I mean, there's the, the 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 kind of subscribers will know. I dive down rabbit holes, and there's so many rabbit holes in your story. I want to dive down. I'm very conscious that uh, I want to keep you for kind of the maximum time ball, so I don't want to keep you all day. It's gonna be the longest episode ever. Um, so I guess I guess the first question is: it was the first kind of uh, rabbit hole I noticed was you mentioned that actually the switch between primary and secondary was when you started to uh, kind of feel the differences. Was that purely in yourself, or was that from the actions or reactions of other students? I think it was a mixture. So I didn't know anyone who had my condition until I was 13, which was when I got involved with Little People UK, which I know we'll dive in later. I could speak all day about that, but I know that's coming later. Um, So Little People UK obviously is where I first met someone who looked like me. And I think anyone who works with teenagers or has been a teenager, which is all of us, yeah, we'll yeah. know that trying to fit in as a teenager is probably one of the biggest adolescent challenges any human faces in their life. Mm-hmm. And I think when you're a girl, that is sometimes perhaps emphasised. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you look different, that is the hardest thing in the world. And I think being different in any way, whether it's a physical disability, a haircut, whatever, is something that teenagers still struggle with. I see it in the teenagers that I work with. And... It was that, really. It was the being the new girl, wanting to fit in, frankly didn't fit in in the sense of my physical makeup. And because I was the only one with dwarfism, quite often I've had to be the first. Yeah. So that means the environments I go into do not have pre-existing awareness or education of dwarfism. Not by anyone's fault, but... At the moment, it's not there. Society isn't there yet. Um, And sometimes teenagers are tough. Mm. And sometimes in the want to fit in, you know, fallouts happen and different emotions go. And because the students in my school didn't have the education that I think we should have had about my condition, that did lead to comments and that did lead to inappropriate behaviour because 
none of us, even myself, knew anything about why I was the way I was. I obviously had an underlying understanding from what my family had told me. And bearing in mind that I had some medical intervention. So when I was going to doctors or hospitals, I was obviously, I couldn't avoid dwarfism completely. I wanted to. No one really spoke openly about it. That was my choice. Yeah. Up until 13, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to acknowledge it. Why would I want to acknowledge why would I want to bring more attention to something that I was trying to avoid in order to fit in? But obviously I was immersed into like this medical world that we all were in when you have a disability or when you have a health condition. So I, I knew bits about it. I knew bits about why I was small, but none of them really pieced together. Okay. And I think not having the confidence in myself, I I brushed it under the carpet. I brushed it under the carpet completely. So when comments or stares or looks did happen, instead of being that confident girl that could probably confront it or educate, I completely closed in. And I think that was my, which probably a lot of people find surprising when they know the work I'm, the line of work I'm in now. But I didn't talk about my condition until the age of 14. You, anyone who knew me, you don't talk about it. I didn't I didn't want anything to do with it at all. Thank you. Wow, by the way, it, 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 it's so powerful to hear kind of this spoken about with such candor and clarity. And also, as we said, I'm one of those people that know absolutely nothing. And I think the reason being is, is because even in the work that I do and with the um, being brought into like diversity and inclusion programs and mental health, all these kind of different things that I get brought into, it's never represented which is why when our paths crossed, I thought, I need to know you. <laughs> I need to know you. No, now. It, it, it isn't. And we're, I think we are further along than 14-year-old me had it. Yeah. We're getting there. Um, but even now, you know, we're not there. And when we, when I speak about Dwarfism Awareness Month, you know, I come across so many people and they don't know it's Dwarfism Awareness Month. They don't know that oh, that's what October celebrates. They don't know the... 80% of people are born with dwarfism. Therefore, actually, any family on this world could one day be affected by the condition. Repeat that, sorry. So 80% of people with dwarfism are born to average high families. Wow. So any... Right. The, 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 the misconception is that you wouldn't be. Maybe yeah. it would be flipped in that sense. So any anyone that you come across, that I come across... You think it's not going to impact you. And therefore, I think there's that in society, there's still a, well, if it doesn't affect me, I don't need to know. Yeah. But actually, you do need to know because A, you could meet someone at any given point who's affected by this condition. Yeah. And B, one day you could be in this. You know, my mum never thought that she would she would have me. She has no genes. My father had no genes. None of my family had dwarfism genetics. I was a genetic fluke. And that brought my family into this world that any family on this world could one day be in. And that's as powerfully simple as it can be. So like you said, your, your need to know the why at an older age, actually, the, the, the original why in that sense, that, that was that was just purely what it was, a genetic fluke. It was a, it was a genetic it was a genetic fluke. And, you know, even now, obviously, I have the dwarfism gene. That does not mean that I will carry that on. If my partner is average high, yeah. my their gene might overweigh mine, yeah. but my child might one day bring the dwarfism, the dwarfism gene may win in a different generation that isn't my next generation. Yeah. But, but ultimately, you know, any, anyone that we walk past in the street could one day be brought into this world. It is a really scary world if you've grown up not knowing anything about it. Yeah. We we talk about awareness, and we're talking about awareness of this and how it's not represented. How much do you attribute that to people not asking the right questions? And I think it's something that's kind of cropped up recently across lots of different themes that maybe it's fueled by cancel culture, for example, that we're really scared of asking genuine questions with the needs to educate ourselves, which we absolutely need to do. Um, but we we do risk that kind of we either blindly agree and, and not be aware 
or we blindly disagree or whatever, and, and we can equally as damaging. Do you think people are afraid of asking questions? And I guess this comes down maybe to even the terminology that people should use around this. Yeah, there is a huge, huge stigma about what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say, in the sense of, you know, I, I see it quite often, you know, out and about, you know, children, anyone who works with children knows they don't have a filter. Anyone who works in, with children or has children, that, that that's a point blank proven statistic. They will say what they see because they're curious. They want to learn. It's not, no child is born ignorant ever. No child is born racism. No child is born sexist. They don't have that knowledge. Mm. We as society give them that knowledge. So I see a lot of parents and children and you can tell that the child really wants to ask or really wants to say something or, or sometimes might even ask the parent. And I don't believe it's always down to ignorance. I think sometimes it's down to fear. Yeah, They're worried that if I hear their child say something, I'll judge them as a parent or yeah. I'll judge them for not knowing the answer or I'll judge them that their child doesn't know the right things I wouldn't expect a five-year-old child to know I was 14 before I learned the ins and outs of my condition and I can't speak for everyone because we are all individual but I'm 99% sure that you will never offend someone by asking because if it's done with that genuine need to educate yourself yeah and yeah. because we'll never I will never judge someone for not knowing the answers. Yeah. I will judge someone for not trying to know the answers. And I think I think so much of the lack of awareness and even the lack of profiling that dwarfism has mm. is down to not wanting to say the wrong thing. So, you know, governments or education systems or I th I think that's where my school perhaps didn't profile dwarfism. Yeah. They didn't want to say the right they didn't want to say the wrong thing yeah you no know, dwarfism wasn't spoken about in my school until I spoke about it the same with my university I was the first one to bring it to the profiling and I don't think it was because of a lack of care I think it was actually an act of care that was handled the wrong way because in trying to protect me they didn't want to offend me and sometimes it's easier to say nothing than to risk saying the wrong thing which then by the byproduct of that is you increase the stigma and potentially offend more people than you do actually it, not. It, it's a really tricky cycle. Yeah. I think it's a lot, it's a cycle that a lot of systems and institutions are in at the moment. Yeah. Not just about dwarfism, but about a lot of things, but dwarfism in the sense of we do not have the knowledge that a lot of other disabilities have. Yeah. Do you know what the, uh, the the kind of the stats in terms of the percentage of the UK population with dwarfism? So there's over 7,000 people in the UK that are affected by dwarfism. Wow. So, and there are over 200 different types of the condition. So we do not all have the same condition, which is another thing that as I've grown up, I've learned that people didn't know. I think when it's embedded in you, you assume people know. Yeah. And then it's not until you engage in those conversations you realize oh actually why would you know <laughs> because it's not part of your life but yeah there are over 200 different forms of um dwarfism which all have their own characteristics um and over seven thousand people in the uk are affected by the condition wow i mean i noticed you do youth work as well and, and obviously a lot of the youth work does you end up working with children that may have had poor upbringings or or adversity in some description you mentioned that there is a a quite um not with any intention but you can ask questions that are quite awkward but actually do you ever find that kind of resistance of people that are just kind of really reflecting their their lives where they are now towards you in terms of um when you're speaking or trying to help people um very often when we talk about things that are not the norm the go to not exclusively but i think especially for young men for boys very often, especially amongst their peer group, I get this, uh, and I'm, a lot of people that work in the space get this. They get the kind of the 
the banter, the the kind of the the kind of the laughing, the sniggering, and that kind of stuff. Um, so have you had that kind of pushback or experience in working in, with youth? I've, I, I I don't think any youth worker can say that they've never had that for some reason or another. I have been really lucky in the communities I work with, especially now that Newport is a very diverse city. Mm. Um, the young people and the organisations and the communities I work with do reflect a high level of diversity. Yes, okay, it might not be the sort of diversity that I bring, but it is still a diverse collective. Um, and, you know, the stares do happen, the laughs do happen, the banters do happen. I think especially when I first qualified, because I qualified in a pandemic. Yes. So I spent my final year, which is when you're supposed to be your most equipped, I spent that final year like in my bedroom. I didn't have access to young people. And then when I did have access to young people, the challenges they were facing were even more extreme than when I went into training because of the climate we were in. And I I remember my first few times on the ground when I went out and did outreach. And I'd be lying if I didn't say I was terrified. Mm. And that's not a reflection of who I was working with that was a reflection of myself I get that that was was a reflection of how are they going to respond to me how you know forget the fact that I was a newly qualified youth worker I was a newly qualified youth worker and the only little person that these young people and communities had ever seen double whammy really wasn't it it was really (laughs) and I was and I was you know I was young I was female you know there was so many things that I had to consider in order to safeguard myself and sometimes that was really overwhelming and the first the first few times I was on the ground were scary and were hard and I did very much look to my senior managers and my co-workers as a support network and that's not saying that anything ever happened I was never hurt nothing no harm ever came to me but I think it was that inner fear that how am I going to establish myself as a professional yeah. in a community where these young people are twice my size? Yeah. You know, I am, you know, you think of authority and you think of, you know, tall and looking over people and kind of like marking their territory, like standing their ground. Mm. Didn't have any of that. I was this small, fragile, newly qualified girl still because I was young and it was it was really it was really scary but I stuck with it and I think that was the with everything that I've ever done sticking with it when anyone ever says oh how have you done that how did you sticking with it yeah now I knew that I was safe I knew that my colleagues had my back I knew that I had the knowledge to do it and a lot of the times I was honest yeah I share you know I and young people respect that Absolutely, because I, I respect that, and you know, sometimes, you know, I, I'll if you ask me, I'll tell you anything. Yeah, because that's how you learn, and you know, I, a lot of the young people I work with face discrimination in other ways, be it because of race, culture, religion, and I can't understand that, but I can understand what it's like to be treated differently, and yeah. I think when you are willing to be open and sometimes a little bit vulnerable, yeah you catch people off guard and that's when they get to know you. And now, you know, any of the young people I work with would have my back if I needed it. A hundred percent. And they, I hope they know that I would have theirs and they don't see my size now. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's always hard going into a new community. It's always hard going into a new group of young people because you know, you've kind of got to do all of that again. Yeah. But, you know eventually you'll get to the point where the relationship is there and it's done before dwarfism. Yeah. Absolutely. They don't they don't see they don't see that. Powerful stuff. Also, by the way, as a West Country girl, you've definitely picked up that Welsh twang. <laughs> I really, I really have. My mum <laughs> my mum says that every time I come home, um, I've definitely I've definitely picked up. I've got I've got a let's say a healthy balance of the two. Yeah. It's, it's a combination of that. I, I love the Welsh vibe. I love the Southwest vibe in a Southwest guy myself. So yeah, uh, but it's a good combination. It works well. <laughs> yeah, 
I guess that brings us nicely through to kind of where you are now. And I said, I've mentioned all the things you're involved with before. Kind of walk us through these things, walk us through life being little and all the other things that you're involved with. And also, like you said, give us a a day-to-day kind of youth worker approach to what you do in that sense as well. Okay, so Life Being Little came from the blog that I started when I was 14. Mm -hmm. And that very much started as almost a bit of a diary in the sense of like sharing my personal experiences. Um, And I think through Meeting Little Pip UK, which is the charity that I work with, um, I learned that it wasn't just me. Like, I was not the only little person in the world. As much as 12-year-old me probably felt like that, I was not that person. There were other people like me. Um, and through, like I said, I've always written, I've always been creative, I've always been expressive and reflective. Um, and, yeah, I, I started a blog when I was 14. Um, and I think as I got older, I started, similar to how you've done with your brand, started to build upon it, started to really make something of it I wanted it to be a tool that uh, that if 14 year old me found it I knew she would have got something from it um so that's where that's where life being little comes from that's where my taglines come from that's kind of Amazing. the brand that I've built for myself in the sense of it's me this yeah. is my yeah. life being little so that's what that's where that's come from by the way, before we move on, all the links to what we're talking about here will be in the bio. So do check out the, the backlog of a decade's worth of blog posts. I can see I'll be doing that for sure. So, um, yeah, but, uh, sorry, Daniel, you move on. I want to make sure that everyone knew that you can find out the links in the bio for this. Yeah, thank you. So, yes. What you get out of it is the unexpected. I guarantee you will find something out about yourself. I got up and stood and said something. And I would never have done that before. Find Your Voice Live is our flagship event where we cross the boundaries of personal development, mental health, transformation and public speaking. I just find it a really, really good, safe place to stand up and talk so great at firing people up but in a way that's on our own terms and what works for you. So I've been invited to a lot of stage talks, a lot of exhibitions and I felt like I needed to sort of improve on the way um, I sort of portray myself and come across during these talks. One of the the biggest things I I think is um, the use of storytelling but also um, how we can um, influence people through taking them through a journey of different emotions. And give my own presentation style, my own speaking style, a little bit of all It gives you so much more confidence, it shows you that, you know, there is nothing to be worried about, it's just, yeah. If someone was really on the fence about this, I would just say, what have you actually got to lose? It's all about getting out of your comfort zone, and this will do it in a very organic and enriched way. Definitely come to this event. <laughs> yeah, just come. Just commit to it, just go for it. Um, well worth the three hour journey for that. Yeah, so that's kind of that element of work. And through my love for writing and kind of telling stories and I only ever really was telling my story, you know, like with the blogs and with doing school assemblies it was always my story but going back again to when I was doing my childcare diploma as we said children they don't have filters they're inquisitive they ask questions now you can imagine being a year one teaching assistant the first hour of my day every school day would probably be questions and you do those questions and then they'd go on with their day then They'd go to sleep, so they'd wake up tomorrow and have a whole new realm of questions. And I never, ever had anything to help me teach them. There was no books. There was no, like we said, dwarfism doesn't have that profiling that mm. perhaps other differences do. So I, I, I didn't have anything. So for one of my college projects, I wrote this story called Mummy, There's a New Girl. And it... It was your typical PowerPoint presentation with a few stick men and a bit of colour 
that I could throw I throw together on a Wednesday afternoon in class. Um, yeah, I was I was sixteen at the time, um, and I used that. You know, I used that as a tool because even though it wasn't a proper tool at the time, I used it as a tool. And then you know, I passed my diploma. I like all school and college work. You throw it under your bed and you leave it there until generations go by. Um, and mummy, there's a new girl stayed there. Mummy, there's a new the PowerPoint that I used stayed there. And it wasn't until probably when we came out of lockdown, because for me, lockdown was really mo- like it was a really big part of my life, not only because of the fact I was trying to do a degree and the fact that I just moved to Wales two months prior. So I was in this new city, new people doing a degree in lockdown. I had it all. Um, but, you know, we talk a lot and I'm sure you've spoken about it with people you work with the impact that lockdown had on people's mental health. Mm. But for me, yes, there were challenges. I cannot deny that. But it lockdown also gave me a sense of protection because I wasn't I wasn't going out and being exposed to negative attitudes on a day-to-day basis. Mm. It shielded me from that. So when we came out of lockdown and that kind of part of my life opened back up, that really was like wow there is a lack of education and awareness in this world um and my co- my colleague and I were walking to work and my colleagues and my friends pick up on things a lot more than I do okay. you know so if someone will do a stare or a laugh I'm not confrontational I do not have the confidence to be confrontational um and if it's a bad day yes it'll get to me but if it's an all right day I can brush it off um but I think naturally the people I'm with have that protective mechanism and something something had happened nothing major a stare a point maybe and we just got talking about education and awareness because naturally in the work we're in we do that every day um and she actually said have you ever thought about writing a book and I started to think about, I was like, oh, no, not really. Because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought about writing a book. But then I knew that actually I had read a book, but it was a very long time ago. So I found the copy of Mummy, There's a New Girl on my laptop. And I, we were still in like the second stages of lockdown by this point. So we were not fully out of it, but we were back we were back things were starting to open back up um and I don't know what on earth got over me but I submitted it to Pegasus <laughs> within within two days of that conversation with my That's... colleague um and I didn't tell anyone did not tell anyone at all and I met David Smith who's my illustrator through um networking on Twitter because at the time I was the company's Um, youth communications officer so I was doing all of our marketing um, and promotion Um, and I I sent him the said notice um, and we came across a challenge again which opened my eyes even more in the sense of he'd never drawn someone with dwarfism wow yeah of course so he was very aware that he wanted to get it right now I knew that I never wanted the book to be about me I created a new character she's not she's not Danielle however the experiences that the character had in the book reflected my experiences so the illustration that you see in the book today is actually me on my first day of school so even though mommy there's a new girl isn't really writing about my story intertwined it it is but for a different audience um and that's that's how mummy there's a new girl came around which is, was my f- my first published children's book it came from 16 year old me having a need for a book 22 year old me seeing the need for the book and being in a support network that just said go for it and I remember anyone who's published a book before it's a really long process life kind of just moves on um 
And I remember getting the email saying, we've accepted it. And I just thought, what? What, what did, <laughs> like, I don't think I really knew. I knew what I had done, but I didn't believe that it was going to happen because wow. I didn't, but like, you know, why I didn't believe that someone else was going to see the need for it because I grew up not seeing the representation. So why is, why is someone going to believe in a project that I wrote when I was 16? But they did and they, they took it on. Um, so we went through the process, which again is a really long process for anyone who's who's been through it. Um, and then the first week that lockdown reopened completely, I was sat at a restaurant with my family and my phone my phone beeped and it said, Mommy, there's a new girl will be released on the 24th of June. And it was that at the time would have been in six weeks time. And I just remember thinking, what on earth <laughs> is happening? You know, I'd gone from... You're far more polite than me because I would have contained a few more expletives than that. But... Yeah, I, 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 it, that's when it clicked to me. I think that's when a shift had. That's when it was like, okay, this is, there's a need for this. You know, it wasn't just me writing little blogs about my experiences. It was actually me writing to influence people's education. And, you know, Mummy There's a New Girl does it on a much more informal and younger level, but that's where education needs to start. Absolutely. Um, so that's how that's how Mummy There's a New Girl came around. And oh no, I love that. It's such a great story and such a, a kind of very human kind of experience for all that as well. It wasn't by design, as I said, it was just happened quite conversationally. Yeah. I love it, that. It was it was never meant to be what it is now. It was never meant to be that. It wasn't written for that. It was written for the part of the stage of my life that I was in at the time. Mm. But then I think through my youth work experience, through my lived experiences of the last few years and reflecting on the gaps, mm. um, yeah, it turned into a, a tool and it's two, year, two years on now. Congratulations. That's amazing stuff. Well done. So you're vice chair of Little People UK. Do you want to give them a shout out? Tell me all about Little People UK. Ah, uh, yes, I will. So Little People UK is the organisation that I got involved in when I was 14. Um, 13, sorry. Um, and like I said, they I hadn't had any exposure, connection with anyone who shared my condition. And I think I needed it. And I think people around me saw that I needed it. But the rebellious kind of, I don't want to talk about my condition. I'm not small. You know, I, I told myself I wasn't small. You know, that, that was the mindset I was trying to get myself in. Because that seemed like the safest mindset to be in. If I don't acknowledge it, somehow this will disappear. It clearly wasn't going to. But naivety was the safest mechanism at that point. Um. So my mum came across this Facebook group that was formed and they had an event in Corby. And, you know, she just said to me, do you want to go? Should we just go? Should we just go go see? If we don't like it, we can come back. I think I refused about five times, but a fit, a knit, eventually we ended up going. And I remember sitting in the car park for an hour because I did not want to go in at all. I did not want... I don't, I think I was scared of confirmation that mm. this condition was as horrible as I thought it was, or like it was, it was going to stop me in any way. Um, but we went in, obviously. Um, and yeah, it completely changed my whole life in the sense of I met people who were teachers, youth workers, uh, doctors, people who, Passed their driving test because obviously that was something I never knew if I was going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. You know, people who had families of their own and people who were in the fashion industry and people who literally were whoever they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I think, and people who also, which really struck me, were happy about this. 
like little, being little was a positive thing and this is something I'd never been exposed to I'd never been exposed to the positivity that my condition held and that's where I think things started to shift that's after coming part of Little People UK that's when I did my first dwarfism assembly to my school that's when I did my first you know talks and writing my blogs and I remember that I did my first ever blog and it was called Life Being Little which is where Life Being Little came from and it was the first I was 14 years old it was the first time I'd ever written or spoken about my condition but I now had confirmation almost that this wasn't a bad thing do you know what I mean like this wasn't a negative thing and And community yeah I had a community behind me you know they we are now a registered charity um you know we work with we have 500 600 members on Facebook now you know we had an event last August that had 200 plus people um and you know we work now to implement and create all of the things that we have just identified do not currently exist so that the future generations do not have the mindset that I did of this is this is negative this is gonna this is gonna stop me in any way because it doesn't it doesn't stop you and you know our tagline is positively unique um because that's that's what it is and I think since little people UK that my whole outlook is has changed and you know it is I'd be lying if I said oh yeah every day is really great and it's sunshines and rainbows and I feel like this every single day and since meeting little people UK you know I absolutely love everything about the card I was given I don't it is it is hard but I now have a network and I'm involved in a network that helps navigate that and so yeah they they are a fantastic organization a fantastic charity um they've brought so much not only to me but to my family and to my network because the people around me have been able to learn as well yeah. um, just this year um for the first time I took my colleagues from Urban Circle to Little People UK they came with me for the weekend um because so Urban Circle is obviously my other organization that I'm involved in yeah. and then they're a youth arts charity in Newport and one of the things they specialize in is dance right. now I've always I've always been creative I've always loved dance but you can imagine that I do not fit into the typical um the dancer what you did think that they look like or what you think that they they can do and you know I have danced for many years but in every dance environment I've been in I've always again I've always been the only one I've never seen any other person at a a comp at a show anything um so this year I had the opportunity to bring both my organizations Urban Circle and Little People UK together um and Urban Circle have been so monumental in the work that I do in upskilling themselves and in helping me find my feet in advocacy and in profiling awareness and what dwarfism means urban circle have been such a huge part of that so to bring them together was amazing um and obviously to kind of it was almost like bringing my two worlds together you know because in urban circle I'm the only little person and now I was bringing my people my colleagues who I knew were like-minded and were open to learning I brought them into Little People UK for them to learn further, for them to see the other side of my world. Mm. But what was so monumental about this collaboration is we taught dance. So very we, cool. We taught dance at Little People UK. Um, and Urban Circle have actually equipped me with the qualifications in the hope that we will create dwarfism dance classes that are available and catered to people of different abilities so you know it's being involved in two monumental um organizations but I think what Little People UK 
showed me is the importance of the right people. Yeah. Which, which then was later confirmed, obviously, by Urban Circle as well. And it's that that I think drives my work. Yeah. It's that I have been in, influ- I am the product. I always say I'm the product of safe places and faces. I had safe places and safe faces, which pulled me through something I probably wouldn't have got through. You know, there's no way that that 14 year old girl who hated her body, who hated her condition, was ever going to be an author, public speaker, vice chair of the charity. It took, yes, it took internal growth as well, but it took the right people and the right environments. And that in itself is is why I do what I do. I love that. I'm a big believer in that as well. It's kind of, it's all about your entourage and, and, and kind of community and everything else. You are indeed a woman on a mission. Of course, Although we were saying just before we hit record, and again, in the spirit of honesty, I was feeling a little jaded this morning um, after a, a particularly busy day working in a school, yesterday youth stuff, um, that there is that risk of being highly driven on a purpose fueled mission. Um, you have all these aspirations and achieving so much. So, Danielle, the question is, how do you recharge your battery? What do you love to do to actually get your energy back up? Um, it is it is really hard. Like, it's... I've had to catch myself a few times and remind myself that I'm only 24 Mm. and that I cannot change generations of opinions or attitudes in the course of what has probably only really been three years. It's really only been three years of this element of work. Yeah. Um, And sometimes that's really hard. And sometimes that's really hard to accept that like, you're not going to get there straight away and it doesn't matter how good your work is, doesn't matter how good your books are, you are not going to change straight away. You're not going to see the results of your work. I might not even see it. My, you know, it's not the day you plant the seed that you see it bloom. Yeah. It's something, it's something we say with our young people. Mm. Um so I've not always been great at that element of slowing down recharging but I think through my youth work and through that element of my training I'm getting better at it yeah and for me I'm very it's all about the people I'm with Mm -hmm. you know I yes I am very career focused for someone of my age I'm very driven by my career but I want to have fun at the same time I want to make memories I want to do things that I enjoy and it's it's a blessing to be able to do so much that I enjoy so you know sometimes going into work is my my time even though it's my work yeah it's a safe it's my safe place it's my you know doing it's different isn't it it's a different yeah. vibe yeah doing, doing dance yes okay I have elements where I'm up skidding and I'm training myself working towards something but I still get that time to express and mm. have have that as well um but yeah I do do always try and make time to stop and acknowledge and mm. try not to move on to the next thing straight away because I'm prone for that as soon as you know, as soon as the first book is out, when's the second? When, like, yeah. as, soon, as soon as one thing's done, when when's the next coming? But actually, I've learned to enjoy what I do, enjoy what I produce, sit on it for a while. And I think, like we said at the start of the podcast, have confidence that when it the time comes, it will come. You know, so many people, when, when you write a book or when you release something, I get asked all the time, when's the next book? When's the next book? But I've stopped trying. I've stopped trying and pushing because when it comes, I know it will I know it will come. So yeah, it's 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 a it's a strange world to navigate when you are working in so many different realms that are so emotionally tied and yeah. so personally demanding. Um but it's the most rewarding place to be um and it's it's taught me a lot cool love that thank you so much 
So the question I ask everybody that comes on the show, it forms part of the playlist available at the end of this season, is this. Let's make it more local for you. I am now the MC of the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff. <laughs> 20,000 people have paid their hard-earned money to come and hear you do your thing. Oh, uh, you sat back in the green room and you, the, you hear me call your name and your crowd go absolutely nuts. And then your walk-on music kicks in, that song that motivates you but lifts you to get you at peak state. Danielle, uh, what would your walk-on music be and why? Oh, goodness. Um, do you know what you actually mentioned to me that you mentioned this to me at the start of the podcast and I still haven't thought of anything um, you know a song that I used to listen to all the time mm-hmm. which I don't think I listen to it as much now but it would probably still be that is Brave by Sa- Sarah Bastel yes nice choice I- I always think that this work started because I was brave. That's all it came down to, because I didn't start with the skills. Yeah. I did not start with the skills. I did not start with the knowledge. I did not start with the understanding. I was brave enough to do it, and then I learned as I went. Like with Mummy, There's a New Girl, I was brave enough to submit it, and then I learned what it took to become an author. With Life Being Little, I was brave enough to write my first blog and then build upon it. I think so many people wait until they feel ready to do something. Right, yeah, absolutely. But I naturally, all the positions I'm in, be it professionally or personally, was because I was brave enough to go, yeah, okay, (laughs) why not? Didn't mean I wasn't terrified. Yeah. But I was brave, and I used to listen to that song all the time when I was a teenager, so I think it would be that one. Maybe that's a universal nudge to tune into that track again, maybe. But, <laughs> yeah, I might I think, start, uh, start getting it on my Spotify playlist again. I think you're right. I think there is a blocker for people to kind of that people wait for perfect to start. And I just said, if if I was waiting for perfect to start, I wouldn't have started. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You only like the, the, if you look back, I mean, hindsight's a beautiful thing. But as we've discovered over the course of this podcast, looking back at your journey, it's all happened through kind of natural evolution in that sense. Um, so why change it <laughs> if it's yeah. working for you and it worked for me it should work for everybody so that's cool yeah it all it all when I look back even though I didn't really understand it at the time and you know I still have things now that I'm trying to navigate and mm-hmm. are sometimes frustrated by or bring me challenge or negative emotions or whatever but when I look back over it all when I really stop and I really look back I was like actually every single thing has I wouldn't be able to do the work I did now if I had, if I was thrown straight into an accepting society and thrown straight into somewhere that was educated, I wouldn't have anything that I have now because I wouldn't have seeked it. I wouldn't have looked for Little People You Care. I wouldn't have written the book. I wouldn't have done my um, blogs. I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't even work in my line of work because I wouldn't have needed a positive adult, so I wouldn't have wanted to become one. Um, so literally ev- everything that I have now does does kind of follow its path. And, oh. yeah, I was – I just decided to be brave. And on that mind-blowing note, <laughs> Daniel, a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for being such an amazing guest. I hope everybody else has enjoyed it as much as I have. Genuinely, you're going to be coming back because I could talk to you for hours. Oh, that's, 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 yeah. I'll be back anytime. <laughs> Please do check out Danielle's links just below the book, the website, and the Little People UK. All the links that we've been discussing today are going to be in the bio. Please do uh, look at them up. And also, I'm sure Danielle will be really happy to hear from you if you have any questions uh, or want to connect in any way. Again, I'll put the links to connect on the bio too. But that's it for now. Again, Danielle, big thank you for being our guest today. Oh, absolute pleasure. Thank you. So everybody else, please hit like, subscribe, all that jazz. You know I'm not a details guy. Whatever it takes to get you back here next Monday, we have another amazing guest coming your way. Uh, So stay tuned and see you then. Be well, take care, be happy. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.